Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. And I'm very glad to continue our reading and discussion of the book. Glad isn't the word. Blessed. I'm blessed to continue to read and discuss this book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, one of the most prophetic books in my library. This morning we're going to begin Chapter 3 in this book. If you're following along, page 70, 70, and did you know that there is a multifaceted war against Protestantism in the world, but especially here in Protestant America? Did you know that the papacy is waging a war against Bible-believing Christians in this country? A war that has so far remained bloodless, but that will soon explode into bloodshed, inquisi inquisitorial-style persecution of God's true people in this country. There's going to be a war in this country, a bloody war, Roman Catholicism against Protestantism. And that is why this program is called Inquisition Update. R.W. Thompson, writing back in 1876, foresaw this. And now, listen to what R.W. Thompson has to say. There's nothing better understood than that the Roman Catholic Church requires all its members to believe that the Roman Catholic Church was established at Rome by the Apostle Peter in obedience to the, the express command of Christ who gave him power over the other apostles for that purpose, that it has possessed from the beginning an external organization composed of the Pope and his army of official dependents who derive directly from God the authority of its exclusive government, and that all who desire eternal salvation must become subject to this authority, because there is not and there cannot be any other true church. Did you know that that's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches all its members? that the papacy, that the Pope himself is the successor of Peter, and that by divine right, that right which is supposedly given by Christ to the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, the right to rule this world in his name. That's what Roman Catholicism teaches, that the Pope is the divine right ruler of the world. Now, it says, from the very nature of things, a church asserting such exclusiveness must be aggressive. This all-absorbing organization cannot be maintained in any other way. And that it is aggressive and uncompromising is shown by its whole history and by repeated and emphatic avowals of its supporters especially of those who share its authority and are tireless in their ex exactions to maintain it. Having found Protestantism the most formidable opponent it ever encountered, encountered to its system of exclusiveness, it has contrived to keep alive in the minds of multitudes of its members a stubborn hostility to every advance among the nations and every improvement in their condition, calculated to drive it from the field, of which, before Protestantism became its rival, it had the undisputed possession. Having regarded the world for many centuries as entirely subject to its dominion, and deriving therefrom a conviction of its supremacy over mankind, it has been unwilling to recognize Protestantism as an equal, entitled to be conciliated, but has habitually considered it as an enemy, to be exterminated and destroyed. No matter what concessions it has obtained, or to what extent it has enjoyed the advantages of Protestant protection and toleration, 
there's never been any abatement of its imperious demands or any softening of its aggressive character. In the United States, where it has enjoyed every possible degree of security which the laws and public sentiment can confer, Roman Catholicism's hostility to Protestantism has never been so open, active, and violent as it is today. Now remember, this book was written in 1876. Much has changed since then, at least in appearance. But mark it down, Rome's goal of world supremacy has never been, di has never been diminished. There is a war going on against Protestantism, and if you know how to see it, you'll see it everywhere, and especially in the ecumenical movement that is raging throughout the churches, this emerging church uh, thesis is a direct attack on Protestantism by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the author continues... He says, the tolerance of our institutions, our Protestant institutions, our free institutions that, that guarantee religious liberty, it says, the tolerance of our institutions has had the effect of awakening energies which seem to have been only slumbering. It has been, it has been manifestly awaiting a more effective concentration of its strength so that Whensoever it shall strike its blows, they may be more powerful and dangerous. A scrutinizing observer cannot avoid the conviction that the moderation it has, here, it, it has hitherto exhibited has been suggested by expediency and policy, not principle, and practiced in order to gain by degrees an unobserved such a position that it may resume its accustomed attitude of defiance and intolerance and assert for itself the quote-unquote divine right of sitting in judgment over our Constitution and laws. What R.W. Thompson's saying is what the thesis that we derive from the Roman Catholic book entitled The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives that early in the colonial period, the Roman Catholic Church sought religious liberty for a time until Roman Catholicism, now being freed by the Constitution of the United States to practice its religion, could grow bit by bit over this entire land and finally gain controlling interest of the government and then overthrow the government and Protestantism and all of our Protestant institutions. That was the inference in so many words that we got from that Roman Catholic book written by a Roman Catholic for Roman Catholics representing the colonial period and particularly the state of Maryland, a Roman Catholic state, declaring religious liberty. Now, let me explain. Why was religious liberty so important to the Roman Catholic colonists of Maryland? Because before they came over here on the Ark and the Dove from Great Britain, Great Britain had kicked the Jesuits out and had shut down the Roman Catholic churches and had nationalized all Roman Catholic church property and even confiscated the land of the, of the Pope and put it back into production for the people of Great Britain. Those who practiced Roman Catholicism were under censure. Why? Because Great Britain had finally gotten fed up with the Pope's interjecting himself in Great Britain through the Roman Catholics of the country and through the Jesuit order. It was a defense mechanism knowing that if Roman Catholicism ever gained the upper hand in Great Britain, it would be the state-sponsored religion as it, was, as it had been in the past and that Protestantism could not be practiced, that Protestantism would be outlawed and the papacy time after time after time by various means 
attempted to overthrow the British Protestant government until finally the government had to concede that there could not be freedom of religion, at least not to be Catholic. It was a matter of self-preservation. So Roman Catholicism was effectively suppressed in Great Britain. And just as much as the Protestants of Europe, who were seeking to come to America to flee Roman Catholic persecution and inquisition and torture, Catholics, too, from Great Britain, came to this country seeking religious liberty. But only for a time. And this is what R.W. Thompson has just confirmed. Now, it says it is worthy of frequent repetition that there's no country in the world where the Roman Catholic Church and its hierarchy are better or more securely shielded in all the just rights of religion, property, and person than they are here in the United States. They are nowhere deprived of any single religious or civil privilege which other churches and people enjoy. The Protestant communities in all the states have universally recognized them as entitled to the same protection they have secured for them. Uh, they have secured to themselves. In this, they have been consistent with the Protestantism they profess, which is not aggressive but tolerant and charitable, not malignant but conciliatory. And this liberty has been shown them, notwithstanding Roman Catholicism has at the same time, in countries where it has had the power to do so, not only denied to Protestantism any equality of privilege or protection with, itse or protection with itself, but has subjected it to continual persecution and indignities. Yet in the face of all this, the same hierarchs who have enjoyed these advantages are now actively organizing themselves and their followers as far as they can influence them into an ecclesiastical army for the vigorous prosecution of a war which they avowed their purpose to carry on unceasingly until Protestantism shall be driven from the field, entirely subdued and overthrown, and all that has been done shall be obliterated from history, so that the world shall be made to bow before the papal scepter. Did you get that? That's the Roman Catholic Church. Don't be fooled by the sheepskin, by the lamb's wool that she has pulled over her wolfish teeth. The ecumenical movement is a Trojan horse. There's a wolf under the wool. And every time you see a Roman Catholic priest on Fox News or CNN or some other mainstream media source... Don't view him as a man of God. View him as a man of the Pope. And their stated goal is to take over this country. And they are well down the road to that accomplishment. Now he says, we should not deceive ourselves to be deceived, excuse me, we should not deceive ourselves or be deceived by others. It is frequently and properly said that we must, by all means, avoid a religious war, and all our best impulses admonish us to guard against so terrible a calamity. It should be the fervent prayer of every good man that providence may so direct the events before us that such a misfortune may never again befall the world, especially that it may never befall a country like ours where so much pains has been taken to construct a government with the idea that Christians ought to dwell together in harmony and brotherly love as one of the cardinal principles. Protestantism can make no such war and can take no part in it except when driven to that extremity by the absolute necessity of self-defense. That's just exactly what England did. Remember, we just discussed it. England was driven 
to the absolute necessity of self-defense from the papacy, that's why she suppressed Roman Catholicism. The same state of affairs R.W. Thompson insists is coming to America. One moment, please. I'll be right back. All right. He continues now. It has thus far proved the only power, he's speaking of Protestantism here, it has so far proved the only power sufficiently imbued with the spirit of toleration and brotherhood of man to discard entirely the engines of torture and persecution and to substitute for them the mild and conciliatory precepts and doctrines of the gospel. All such wars have hitherto been the work of those who claim to be the exclusive custodians of the true faith, and who under the influence of this sentiment are made exacting, aggressive, and uncompromising, and not the work of those whose liberalizing Christianity gives play to all the charities of life and all the best affections of the heart, and whose religion is founded on love. But can we confidently promise ourselves that we shall escape a religious war? The danger lying before us, and possibly not far off, is that such a war may be precipitated upon us in spite of ourselves, not necessarily a war of bloody battlefields, but of aroused, excited, and angry passions, which, intensified by sectarian hatred and partisan violence, may by possibility lead to the same deplorable results which have followed similar conflicts elsewhere. R.W. Thompson is about to predict how this religious war is going to be precipitated. It'll be cloaked behind sectarianism and partisan violence, but it will be religious in character with a religious motive. And he doesn't want us to be deceived. He says the papacy, if history speaks truly, has in its wonderful progress made many such wars. And as it claims never to have had any change or shadow of turning in the pursuit of its objects, its power to inaugurate still another may not be altogether lost. Are there no evidences of a deeply seated and secretly cherished purpose to invite in the United States a fierce and fiery contest between the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church acting for the papacy and those who profess the principles of Protestant Christianity? The answer to such a question is this cannot... It, Excuse me. The answer to such a question as this cannot be expected in any open and public avowals. The purpose of cunning and experienced adversary, excuse me, the purposes of cunning and experienced adversaries are not usually revealed, but some light is thrown upon it by the literature which those who compose this hierarchy are now scattering broadcast over the land, containing in books, magazines, pamphlets, newspapers, and tracts, silent messengers which they convey words of authority and command to the faithful that they are required not to disobey under the penalty of committing an offense against God. There appeared in France only a few years ago a small work which has been translated into English, republished in this country, and is now sold by leading Roman Catholic booksellers in our principal cities. Extraordinary pains has been taken to secure for it a large circulation so that it may reach all the members of the Roman Catholic Church and be read by them. It has a suggestive title, plain talk about Protestantism today, and professes to be a talk with Catholics rather than with Protestants, in order that they may be instructed as to their duty. It is written in a spirit peculiarly offensive and aggressive, and treats Protestantism as having, 
quote-unquote melted away in rationalism and infidelity and as exhibiting nothing of a religious nature, quote, but the ruins, unquote, which are only, quote, a source of annoyance, unquote, because, quote, however dismal they appear, they still afford a, a refuge to the wicked who dare not show themselves on the highways, unquote. That is, that these Protestant ruins are only a shelter for such as dare not confront the indignity of those who serve the papacy. That's right. Your dirt under the nails of Roman Catholic fingers. If you're a Protestant, you are in rebellion, you are heretical, and you dare not lift your eyes and gaze upon a Roman Catholic in this country. That was the attitude put forth in this document, plain talk, about Protestantism today. And if you think Rome's attitude has changed toward Protestantism since Vatican Council II, I've got a bridge to sell you. It says, it is an artful and cunningly contrived attack upon Protestantism throughout the world. And although designed especially to stimulate the Roman Catholics of France into antagonism against the Protestants of that country, yet its republication and circulation in the United States, under the immediate patronage of the Roman Catholic hierarchy, furnishes undoubted evidence of their avowal of this con of its contents and of their design to transfer the attack from Europe to this country it is a bold and direct challenge to the contest it invites and conclusively proves that the war will go on whether Protestants take part in it or not Assuming, with the dogmatic air of superiority so common with all its class of writers, that the Protestant forms of religion are no religion at all because they reject the authority and teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, the author makes this announcement. Quote, After having rejected the Church, that is, the Roman Catholic Church, after having rejected the Roman Catholic Church, Protestantism rejects Jesus Christ. After having rejected Jesus Christ, it must reject God himself, and thus it will have accomplished its work, unquote. At another place, in further continuation of the same idea, he says, quote, The Protestant, whether he believes it or not, is an infidel in germ, and the infidel is a Protestant in full bloom. Infidelity exists in Protestantism as the oak exists in the acorn, as the consequence is in the prom as the consequence is in the premise. Unquote. Have you ever heard of a greater condemnation of Protestantism? That's Roman Catholicism. And why does the Roman Catholic Church hate Protestantism so much? Because it is the Church of Antichrist. And it views Protestantism as its most lethal enemy. And that would be the true Christ. Protestantism is Bible-believing Christianity. It must repent of ecumenism. Here's what... The Roman Catholic hierarchy said to Roman Catholics in France about Protestants, and this was republished and widely distributed in the United States of America. It says, after having rejected the Roman Catholic Church, Protestantism rejects Jesus Christ. After having rejected Jesus Christ, it must reject God himself and thus it will have accomplished its work. In another place, in further continuation of the same idea, he says, the Protestant, whether he believes it or not, is an infidel in germ, and the infidel is a Protestant in full bloom. 
infidelity exists in Protestantism as the oak exists in the acorn as the consequence is in the premise. Unquote. That's the secret but true position of the Roman Catholic Church post-Vatican II against Protestantism. Now, those ought to be alarming words to anybody, in including Catholics, if they love the free institutions of this Protestant nation. Now, the unmistakable design in this formal arraignment of all Protestants as infidels, to say nothing of its want of true and Christian charity, is to keep the papal followers in remembrance of what their church dogmatically and imperiously teaches, that all other religions besides their own is false and heretical, and that it is their duty both to God and the church to oppose and resist Protestantism to the extremity of total extermination. With this thought continually present in their minds, it is doubtless supposed that they can be kept in readiness at all times for any future emergency. And the difficulties in the way of bringing about this unity are much less than many suppose, although in this country they are gradually diminishing under the liberalizing influences of our Protestant institutions. They are sufficiently great, however, even here, to demand thoughtful attention. Spoken like the true Secretary of the U.S. Navy that he was, he assessed the Roman Catholic Church as the gravest threat to this Protestant constitutional republic. And he said it demands our thoughtful attention. He continues, he says, the profession of faith promulgated by Pope Pius IX after the council, or excuse me, Pope Pius IV, after the Council of Trent, and re-proclaimed by Pope Pius IX, and we were talking about the encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864, it is simply a reiteration of that position taken by the Roman Catholic Church against Protestantism at the bloody Counter-Reformation Council of Trent. He declares that, quote, no one can be saved, unquote, who believes otherwise than according to the faith of the Roman Catholic Church and requires all thus believing to, quote, promise true obedience to the Bishop of Rome, unquote, as an absolute necess uh, necessary and indispensable part of the true faith, Roman Catholicism, of course. What are the nature and extent of this true obedience will sufficiently appear elsewhere. For the present, it's only necessary to observe with what unerring certainty each step in the papal system leads to this obedience, it being recognized everywhere as the necessary part of the true faith, again, Roman Catholicism, according to them. Inasmuch as the duty of obedience requires that there should exist somewhere a governing authority having the right to demand and exact it in case of refusal, this author proceeds to show what it is and in whose hand it is lodged. He says, quote, The teaching of the Church, speaking of the Roman Catholic Church, the teaching of the Church is the true rule of faith, unquote. A, de a, a declaration with which liberal-minded Protestants would not be disposed to, find, uh, disposed to find any fault if there had not been in, in its government so radical a departure from the practices of the apostolic times. In other words, Protestantism is a departure from the true faith of Jesus Christ. And it says, but in order to exclude the idea that the church as a whole has any right to participate in the declaration of the faith or can have any authority through its representative bodies, he says that Christ appointed 12 among his disciples and sent them forth to the world to teach in his name 
and with his authority, the Christian religion, unquote, and that, quote, pastors of the Catholic Church ascending through a legitimate and uninterrupted proce uh, pro uh, procession to St. Peter and to, other, and to other apostles have exercised and do exercise in this ministry, there being, of course, no teaching authority in the world besides what they possess. In other words, their authority, their teaching authority comes from Peter, who was given that authority by Christ. And they're the only ones who possess the authority to teach the gospel. The Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church only. Now it says, and for fear that some inquisitive mind <clears throat> might conclude that this teaching authority was not infallible on account of the heretical tendencies of some and the personal unworthiness of others of these pastors, and we might add, such as the pedophile priests of today, he proceeds still further to exclude all idea of church representation by concentrating the whole of it in the hands of the Pope. That's right. All authority of the Roman Catholic Church to teach falls on the breast of the Pope. The Pope is the church. And, and R. W. Thompson will confirm this as we continue. He says, with him, that is the Pope, this official functionary of the church is the church itself. There you have it. And it says, whatsoever authority Christ gave to the church, he gave to him, the Pope, alone. As the authority conferred by Christ was divine... Therefore, his, the Pope's, authority is divine also. And this is the root of what is called the divine right of kings. There is but one king, according to the Roman Catholic Church, there is but one true king on the planet. That is the so-called vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, the Pope. And he shares that divine right by picking the kings and the prelates of the Roman Catholic Church, and they share that divine right. There's no one else on the earth that has the authority, according to the Roman Catholic Church, to seat and unseat kings. The divine right of kings comes from the Pope, and any king who is crowned by the Pope shares that divine right to rule. It says, as the authority conferred by Christ was divine, therefore the Pope's authority is divine also. As whatsoever was spoken by Christ were the utterances of God himself, therefore when the Pope commands in all the domain of faith and morals, it is God who commands. Now, how else can you take that statement but that, but that the Pope is God on earth? And thus he defines it, quote, And in what does this ministry consist? That power which is derived from Jesus Christ himself, and by which fallible men teach us infallibly, and in and infallibly lead us in the path of salvation? It is the authority of the church, to wit, the authority of the sovereign pontiff, successor of St. Peter, head of the church, and the authority of the bishops, coadjutors to the Pope in the grand work of the salvation of men. That's it. All salvation is derived not from Christ, but from Antichrist, according to the Roman Catholic Church. Anti being the prefix that means replacement of. Look it up in any dictionary. He is opposed to Christ because he claims to represent Christ and to replace Christ on the earth. That's the papacy. There's no more vivid, admitted 
and advertised and boasted about self-proclamation by the papacy that he is the biblical and historical Antichrist. His very title alone makes him Antichrist. Vicar of Christ simply means the representative or replacement of Christ. It's the same word as the word Antichrist. Vicar of Christ means Antichrist. And according to the Roman Catholic Church, you cannot be saved unless you are a member of that church. The Pope is the divine right ruler of the world. This is the very heart and soul of the new world order. And as I've said so many times on the program, there's nothing new about it at all. This order existed previously for 1,260 years during the reign of the Dark Ages when the Pope ruled supreme over the kings of the earth and God-fearing, Bible-believing, Bible-reading people were slaughtered by the hundreds of millions. Now, Rome would like us to forget all those days, but R.W. Thompson is not going to allow us to forget those days. And he asserts that those bloody days are about to repeat themselves because we've forgotten history. He says this divine authority entrusted as it is in the hands of men is the true and only rule of faith. It has been thus believed in all Christian ages. It has been thus taught by all doctors and fathers of the Roman Catholic Church. We have to believe only what the Pope and his bishops teach. We have to reject only that which the Pope and the bishops condemn and reject. Should a point of doctrine appear doubtful, we have only to address ourselves to the Pope and to the bishops in order to know what to believe. Only from that tribunal, forever living and forever assisted by God, emanates the judgment on religious belief and particularly on the true sense of the scriptures, unquote. You ever hear such blasphemous terms in your life? Thus, the personality of the believer is merged in the superior personality of the Pope. All right of personal inquiry is taken away from him. Whosoever the Pope through the bishop shall command the behavior to accept, uh, excuse me, shall command the believer, the believer to accept, that he shall accept. Whatsoever to reject, that he shall reject. And whatsoever to do, that he shall do. If he obey, he shall be saved. If he refuse, he shall be damned. There's no middle ground, no room for hesitation or doubt. The authority is omnipotent, and the obedience must be thorough and complete. Succeeding thus, he is supposed, in eradicating from the mind all sentiments of individuality and any advantages to be derived from an intelligent private judgment. He directs his readers that they shall not look to the Bible as furnishing a proper and sufficient rule of Christian faith. Roman Catholics are not to look to the Bible for instruction in righteousness. He says, quote, The Bible contains nothing but what is the teaching of God, and yet the Bible is not. The Bible cannot be the rule of our faith in the Protestant sense. Why? First, the Bible cannot be the rule of our faith because Jesus Christ has not said to his disciples, quote, go and carry the Bible, but he said, go and teach all nations. He that heareth you heareth me, close quotes. The nature of our present inquiries does not require such a discussion here as is invited from the theologian by this extract. Yet the passage, the passing remark may be indulged that when Christ said, Search the scriptures, for in them ye have eternal life, 
and they are they which testify of me, he fixed no limitation upon the number who should do so, and was addressing the Jews who were persecuting him for healing the impotent man on the Sabbath day, and was not reproaching the Pharisees merely because they read the Scriptures, as is incorrectly asserted by the Roman Catholic Church, in furtherance of the doctrine that everything must be taken from the Pope and his coadjutors without any personal investigation of the Bible. It's the Church of Antichrist because it's against the Bible. It puts the Pope ahead of God's holy word. Now, by shutting up the Bible or allowing it only to be read with accompanying explanations of certain passages, which explanations are to be taken as infallibly true, it is designed to stifle all personal investigation of its contents. Such has always been the invariable policy of the Roman Catholic Church, the right to read it at all on the part of the laity, having been conceded only on in obedience to the popular demand occasioned by the Reformation. And this policy is now persistent, uh, persisted in without variation, except in so far as it is modified by circumstances. In Roman Catholic countries, the laity know but little, and multitudes of them know nothing of the contents of the Bible. But when, when, when Roman Catholicism comes in direct contact with Protestantism, it allows the Bible to be read, but only upon the condition that he who reads it shall not employ his own reason in deciding what it teaches, but shall take the explanatory notes attached as the equal as of equal validity with the body of the book itself. That is, that, quote, what the Pope and the bishops teach, unquote, is as much the work of divine inspiration as what the apostles and the prophets taught. Manifestly, the fear exists that in the present condition of the world, when the human mind is stimulated to extraordinary efforts to search out the truth in every department of thought, if the laity are permitted to accept such impressions as the Bible itself will leave upon their minds, the papacy will, in the end, be driven from the field, routed, and discomfited. And that's exactly what happened during the Protestant Reformation. People left the Roman Catholic Church. They left the authority of the bishops and the popes behind they got God's authoritative word. They read it for themselves under the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit. And individually, they pro proclaimed their liberty. And that routed the papacy and discomfited the papacy and drove him from the field. That was the success of the Protestant Reformation. That's the weapon against which Satan has no defense. The Bible and the Bible alone. That's what led the Protestant Reformation, and that's what will defeat the papacy today. If we will just pick it up and read it and recognize in it the description of Antichrist in the Scriptures, just as is R.W. Thompson describing for us in his book. Most of the opposition that I get from what I talk about on Inquisition Update, when I utter these same words on amateur radio, it's because people simply will not accept the papacy as anything but an institution of God. Funky as it may be, he dresses funny, he talks funny, but he's a Christian. He says, Jesus is the Savior, doesn't he? And they simply will not comprehend. They won't look at the facts on the ground. They simply watch the, the puppet show on television. Whenever the Pope speaks, he speaks of Jesus Christ, doesn't he? Well, he must be a Christian. And you, Tom, you can't be a Christian if you criticize the Pope or the Roman Catholic Church. It's the Christian Church. But when you study Roman Catholicism 
and compare it with the Bible, you can come to no other conclusion but that this is the synagogue of Satan and the Pope is the Antichrist. And once that sinks to the marrow of your bone, you admit the reality and come out of denial and accept the truth of that fact, then you begin to investigate what the Roman Catholic Church is doing in this country and the world. And all of a sudden, Fox's Book of Martyrs comes alive, and you might even be tempted to read it. It seems the most difficult part of my job is to convince people, Christians, with all the mountains and mountains and mountain ranges of evidence there is to prove the fact. Christians are willfully ignorant of this, in of this information. It's a blindness that can hardly be penetrated. But R.W. Thompson gets it. And not necessarily from a religious or biblical point of view, from just a plain, close scrutiny of history and current events as they existed in his time. It says, For fear, therefore, that this mode of thoughtful investigation should prevail, should prevail to weaken the authority of the Pope and his bishops, Monsignor Seeger lays down this rule of the government of the faithful. Quote, The first rule is that we should receive both the text and the interpretation of the Scriptures from the legitimate pastors of the Roman Catholic Church and from them alone, unquote. But he does not leave the object which prompts the suppression of the free circulation and the perusal of the Scriptures to go unexplained, for at another place he says, quote, the Protestant Bible is only a false skin in which infidelity and revolution wrap themselves, unquote. By these gradual approaches, he, like a skillful commander, reaches his ultimate object, never absent from his mind, which is to show to those Roman Catholics to whom his book is especially addressed what the papacy expects of them in their conduct toward Protestantism. They are required to resist and oppose it, because it teaches infidelity and revolution which are wrapped up in the Protestant Bible. Thus, fixing his premise and preparing his readers for the avowal, he ventures upon these bold and reckless assertions, which are made the more important by their repetition in the United States. Quote, Wherever Protestantism has a sway, it is intolerant and persecuting. Do you believe that? He actually had the nerve to say that Protestantism, that gave him the freedom of speech to utter this nonsense, is intolerant and persecuting? This Monsignor Seeger who took the liberal Protestant constitution as the basis for his speech? A nation that tolerates Roman Catholicism hardly without criticism allows it to practice to acquire wealth and property and gold and to command the Congress and the Presidency and the Supreme Court of the United States. This nation where Roman Catholicism can practice unhindered and nearly unquestioned takes the opportunity to say that Protestantism is intolerant and persecuting? The Church of Intolerance and Persecution is the Roman Catholic Church. History proves it, and the future will verify it, the very near future. Come back tomorrow as we continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson.